All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'll just get right into it here. So I wanted to um, provide a new slide here just to kind of review the types of materials that we are covering in these so-called Enviro DIY and stream monitoring monthly meetings for the Delaware River Basin. Um, learning communication discussion questions, overall sort of just um, addressing watershed ecology issues with focus on Enviro DIY monitoring stations, specifically conductivity, water temperature and depth, mostly in, in turbidity, um, <clears throat> stream monitoring, certainly associated with a lot of the synoptic sampling type stuff a lot of groups have been doing, overall freshwater ecology concepts and data and so on. And then this um, topic of data to action, um, sort of related to what our local wa local uh, policy and practice work group has been doing. Um, tools and resources, you know, an example of that is what we're going to be presenting on today, Model My Watershed, one of the Wiki Watershed toolkits, one of the Wik Wiki Watershed tools within the Wiki Watershed toolkit, and then other topics, conservation, environmental education, and so on. Um, this is our agenda today, norm, normal introductions, normal Stroud updates. We'll have an update from the work group, and then we'll get into the Model My Watershed presentation. We'll have an overview and a case study, and then we'll have hopefully have a little time for discussion. As a reminder, the meeting is being recorded. Um, all of the recordings are available at this resources page, wikiwatershed.org slash DRWI. If you just go to the Wiki Watershed page, there's a tab there in on the upper in the upper right where that reads DRWI, but you can click on that and it'll take you to the same spot. These meetings are every third Thursday of the month, 2.30. Zoom link remains the same. Store that for your records if you like. Please feel free to be in touch if um, you have folks that would like to be on the email distribution that are not currently on that for reminders about the meetings and other uh, communications. Um, folks who are attending these meetings, just as a reminder, those working in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative and those just working in the DRB in general. Um, some folks attending from outside the DRB were supporting this with DRWI funds as well as Seesaw. Um, four states, one source is the DRWI webpage. Seesaw Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds allows the Stroud Center to provide assistance to watershed groups in Pennsylvania. Um, three of us here, uh, sort of the immediate kind of facilitators of these meetings and monitoring in the DRB associated with Enviro DIY and the snapshots and just general sort of support on data monitoring, watershed ecology and so forth, particularly in this in the community science realm. Uh, these three master watershed stewards, among a number of others that are um, you know involved on a day to day basis with this. Um, with this work, um, the three leads in the DRWI at the Stroud Center. And um, just as a review, primary goal from the Stroud Center perspective in this um, context remains to support uh, watershed groups, station owners, and the volunteers supporting the stations and using the stations for their own local purposes certainly supporting the, the work with uh, data analysis and developing tools, uh, providing overall support in that way. So a few updates. Um, uh, I've mentioned snapshots a few times. We are continuing to support snapshots with watershed groups, primarily with regard to salt, chloride, and conductivity and water temperature. Uh, water temperature we've generally been doing in the summer. Um, so if you if you're thinking about that, it's not too early to start planning for that. So you can and certainly salt really one of the best times to measure salt is when it, when the water is low in the summertime and all those ions are concentrated and give you an idea of the worst conditions that are kind of um, uh, that organisms are exposed to in base flow conditions. So be in touch if you'd like assistance on that or guidance on that. Also, if um, if you'd like 
uh, the Stroud Center, Diane, to um, you know amplify your stories or to communicate your stories on social social media, um, please feel free to be in touch. Uh, I'll pass it off to Ian for a quick update of the of the local policy and practice work group. Every first Thursday of every month, we get together as a group um, and are continuing our discussions about the development of several uh, documents. Um, Dave, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, in we are also uh, um, working to create um, more opportunities for people to experience these documents, figure out what we're doing. Um, we are going to be participating in the EAC Network Virtual Conference um, on February 24th. If you're interested, there's an agenda and registration link um, at the link that you see on the page. We can also send that out uh, if you uh, email us and, ex uh, and express your interest. And next, thank you. Um, the uh, short-term charge has not really changed. We're still a group that's devoted to creating these five documents um, ranging from con conductivity through turbidity. Um, we currently are working on the conductivity document. Uh, we have finished the temperature and the fifth document, which is the uh, municipal engagement document. Those two are currently um, made available Dave, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, we are ready to use and for ready for use uh, with the municipal document, as I had just mentioned, and the temperature document uh, while working on the conductivity one currently. Um, we're developing one page um, uh, facil facilitatory uh, documents uh, to help with the stream temperature and any of the other documents that we're creating. Dave, next slide, please. For the two documents that have already been published, you can find them at managemywatershed.org. I'll put a link in chat um, where you can find both of the documents that are ready for use. Um, please take a look at those, uh, and we are always welcome to feedback. Uh, there should be directions on there for how to give us feedback. Um, but that is the link that you would use to get to these two documents. And Dave, next slide, please. Okay, good, Ian? Yep, I think we're good. Okay. Um, any questions before we move on? Okay. Uh, today's presentation, or presentations, I should say, are on Model My Watershed. Scott Ensign, um, Assistant Director and Research Scientist at the Stroud Center, is going to do an overview of Model My Watershed. Steve Tricarico, Penn State Master Watershed Steward, and um, member of Tulpa Hawk and Creek Watershed Association will be presenting a couple case studies. So with that, I will stop share and allow Scott to take over. Thanks, Dave. As we were just talking, I couldn't, I couldn't, this uh, phrase came into my head some of you may have heard it before, but I thought it was just a nice precursor to what we're going to talk about. If you've ever heard the phrase, all models are wrong, but some are useful, I just wanted to throw that out there for if you've heard that before. We should keep in mind whenever we're using models of any kind, and Model My Watershed is no exception, that it's designed to do a thing and make a prediction in some way. That doesn't mean it's always right. And it doesn't mean that it's right in every context. And all of us in the scientific community who use models are always have a little bit of reluctance and we should be very careful about the models that we're using, how we interpret the output and how we talk about those predictions in the real, real world. So 
I just thought of that and I Googled it. And of course the Wikipedia entry comes up and there's actually a very long history uh, of going through and figuring out who said that phrase and where it came from and how it's evolved over time. So anyway, I thought that was a good precursor to talking about models. Uh, they're not always right, but they do some things well sometimes for particular purposes. Um, so that's a precursor to what we're gonna talk about here. So let me switch over to the real deal. All right, I'm gonna go through um, three different sections, anticipating taking about five minutes per each and I'm getting my control set up. So we'll do questions after um, Steve and I work through this material. Lots to talk about, happy to take questions, but I'm gonna try to click through and uh, get through these slides pretty quickly. So. Uh, again, we're going to do this in three parts. And the first is just to talk about very simple application of model by watershed, which really doesn't involve models at all. But then we'll talk about the two models that are available in this mapping tool. Okay, so the first part of this series is to talk about using model by watershed as a mapping tool. And if you go to modelmywatershed.org, you'll come to this screen, and this is where we start. If you want to navigate quickly to a particular location, you can use the address bar in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And once you've found the area that you're interested in, you'll start to explore the layers that are down on the bottom of the screen. And this starts with stream layers. There are three different stream layers in Model My Watershed that you can visualize one at a time. Of course, the Delaware data is only available in the Delaware River Basin, and you'll see differences between the resolution of these different stream layers. On the layer button at the bottom, there's also a coverage grid. Clicking on that coverage grid will give you access to a large number of different layers that you can view land use layers starting in 2019, going back to 2011, a soils layer, elevation, slope, precipitation, temperature, protected lands, active river area, and then a series of layers specific to the Delaware River Basin, followed by Pennsylvania urbanized areas and municipalities. So clicking on each of these layers will give you a visual. You can control the, the opacity of that layer using the slider tool that's right next to the coverage grid word in the bottom of the screen. Also note that there's an information icon next to each of these layers, which will give you a legend for understanding what the different colors mean within a layer. So that's the coverage grid. Just to the right of that is an icon for boundaries. And this uh, series of layers includes three predefined USGS defined watershed units, also county lines, congressional districts, and school districts. So you can explore those layers by turning them on and off. Next to the boundaries at the very bottom of the screen are observations. And this will show you weather stations that are being used within Model My Watershed models, which we'll talk about later. And finally, there's a base maps layer in which you can turn on topography, satellite imagery, and terrain, just as you would in any kind of Google Maps or other mapping interface. So those are ways to simply explore what's on the surface of the Earth around you. But at this point, we want to get started with some um, more specific ways to visualize your watershed or your area of interest. And there are four ways to do this. I'm going to focus right now on delineating a watershed because in many cases, this is what's most relevant to you. You are probably interested in the land use upstream of a point on a river or a stream. And that's what we use the delineate watershed feature for. Now, if you're in the Delaware watershed, you can use the Delaware high resolution watershed uh, for delineating. But otherwise, if you're outside the Delaware, you'll use the continental US medium resolution data. 
So selecting that continental US medium or the Delaware high resolution data, and then dropping a point anywhere on the map, it does not have to be on a blue line representing a stream, it can be in landscape. And you'll notice that there's a little wheel on the left that's gonna turn as the model's working and your point that you collect will also be noted on the map. In a matter of moments, the delineation will complete and you'll be given an information page on the left-hand side summarizing all of those features which are in that watershed. Note at the on the map itself, we have the record of where you collect, that's the purple point, and the blue point is the nearest stream down slope of the point that you clicked. Now at this point, you can change any of the layers to continue to create customized visualizations of what's in that watershed. You can also change the area and go back and change the area that you delineated. But at this point, I wanna focus on the information that's summarized on the left-hand side. We see that there are a variety of different tabs on the top. There's streams, land, soil, terrain, climate, point sources, animals, and water quality. Now, again, you can customize your map. Uh, you'll notice that in this particular example, you can turn on the layer that's being summarized to better visualize those changes, but you can visualize changes in, or the distribution of streams. Uh, clicking to the land tab will allow you to visualize the land use and land cover within the watershed that you delineated. But notice that there's a drop down option to visualize and document in both a bar chart and a table land use, land cover in prior years. So it allows you to see changes over time. What's also useful is that you can see a tab of exactly what land uses and land covers are, avail are within that watershed as a breakdown of the percent of the watershed or the area. Notice throughout as you scroll through these various information summaries that in some cases there's an information icon. So please remember to click on that icon for more information about a particular layer or summary that you're seeing. Note that you can also download any of these tables for use outside of Model My Watershed. And that concludes how you can use Model My Watershed as a very simple tool for visualizing what's within a watershed boundary. And at this point, I want to explore the first of two models that's included in Model My Watershed. And the first simulates water and pollutants from a one-day rainfall event. Once you've finished analyzing your watershed of interest, select the Model tab at the top left of the Model My Watershed interface. When you've selected the Model tab, you'll see a series of options. The Site Storm, site storm Model is the first option listed. Select the Site Storm Model. The Site Storm Model simulates a hypothetical 24-hour storm event using a combination of three different models, SLAM, TR55, and EPA's Step L. This application is designed primarily for use with smaller, more developed watersheds. At this point, the models run, but before we look at the model results, I want to encourage you to go to wikiwatershed.org backslash help backslash model dash help to look for documentation about the site store model. And you'll see that at the bottom of the screen. I strongly recommend that before you try to interpret the results, that you spend some time understanding what the model is that will help you interpret the results. So once you've selected the site store model, the, it will run in a matter of moments and the results will be summarized in a pane on the left-hand side of the screen. In this case, we're looking at the current conditions of that watershed as it relates to the amount of runoff after a 24-hour event and the water quality. Notice that this is represented as both a stacked bar chart and as a table. 
Clicking on the water quality tab in the current conditions pane will show you the total suspended solids, nitrogen, and phosphorus moving through that watershed after a 24-hour rainfall event. Notice that if you change the slider of precipitation in the top of the screen, your results, model results, will update on the fly. So the precipitation here, in this case 2.5 centimeters, is the amount of rainfall during the 24-hour event that the model is simulating. The power of Model My Watershed and the Site Storm model is the ability to change features in your watershed to see how those changes affect the water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment flux. So by clicking Add Changes to this area, you'll have options for changing both land cover and conservation practices. There are 12 different land cover classes that you can change and six different conservation practices. Notice that by hovering over any of these icons, the display will show you a description of what that land cover is and what that conservation practice is. By selecting any one of these options, you'll be given the ability to draw an area on your map representing this new change that you've selected. You do this by clicking once and then clicking as you outline a shape, double clicking to finish the operation. At this point, you've identified a size of the watershed, an area of the watershed that will be applied with a different land cover or conservation practice. The model does not care where you draw that, only that the size of it is appropriate for your application. In this case, we can see that one modification has been made in this area as represented by the gold polygon, in this case, in no-till agriculture, which I applied within the model. As that change was made, the model updated in real time with the results. But at this point, you've created a new scenario and now you want to rename that scenario using the tool on the upper left, the drop down from new scenario allows you to rename it. And you want to rename this with something that you can remember represents what you did. Now, the great feature of Model My Watershed and the most powerful part of it is that you get to compare the effect of that change in land cover or conservation practice with the current conditions. And you do this by selecting the compare button at the top left. And this will show you as either a bar chart or as a table, the differences between your new scenario and current conditions and by default, it will also include a comparison with a predominantly forested watershed that would represent the landscape outside of human interest influence. Notice that you can change between the bar graph or the table. You can also download these data using the icons in the upper right. You can also change the precipitation during the one day storm event that this model is representing by changing the slider and your results will update in real time as you move that slider. At this point, you've done quite a bit of work and investigation. It's to your advantage to log in if you have a Model My Watershed account. If you don't, you can create one for free and rename your project to something that's meaningful to you and it will be saved in your project, projects list automatically. At this point, you can add a, an additional modification of land cover or conservation practice to your existing scenario, or you can add a new scenario and, and also compare this new scenario with the prior ones that we've discussed. Finally, you may wish to share this model and the output with others. You can do that by clicking the share button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen turning on link sharing, 
and then copying and pasting the link to your model and its results into a document or email. The third part of this series of describing how to use Model My Watershed involves simulating water and pollutants over an annual time period. If you followed through the last example, you'll know that we use the site storm model to simulate a one day storm event. At this point, you can change the model that you're using by clicking the details button and then selecting the model edit button. And that will take you back to the model, original model page where we're going to select the watershed multi-year model. The watershed multi-year model simulates the average monthly water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment flux using the generalized watershed loading function enhanced model version. This model is designed primary, primarily for large, more rural areas. And once you select that button, the model will run, and in a matter of moments, you'll have the results displayed on the left-hand side of the screen, starting with hydrology and a dropdown that will allow you to select stream flow and various hydrologic parameters that are represented in the model. You can visualize these as a graph and in the table below specific to each month. But before we go any farther talking about the results, I want to strongly encourage you to go to wikiwatershed.org backslash help backslash model dash help to explore and read the technical documentation about this model. It's very important that you understand how the model is operating and how to interpret the data from the model. Taking you specifically to the watershed multi-year model discussion in wikiwatershed.org's help page. At this point, we'll start exploring more features within the model results. Again, note and look for the information buttons that will allow you to find more detail about specific parts of the model results shown on the left-hand summary page. Switching from the hydrology tab to the water quality tab, you'll see results for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment represented as tables. Notice that in the lower left-hand pane, in scrolling down, we can see that nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment are apportioned into various land cover categories within the watershed that you're modeling. Now, again, the power of Model My Watershed and its real utility is making changes to this watershed and seeing how those changes affect water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment flux. We do this by selecting the Add Changes to this Area button in the upper right. At this point, we'll see that we have options that appear for changing weather data, land cover, and conservation practices. And I'm going to talk specifically about changing the land cover and conservation practices. We do that by selecting those two buttons, land cover or conservation practice, We'll start with land cover. Selecting the land cover button will give you an interactive uh, display that allows you to either select presets to change the land cover, perhaps to a prior year, or to customize the amount of individual land cover areas that are within your area. For example, changing forest to farmland or vice versa. We can also select the Conservation Practice tab and have access to 10 different rural and four urban conservation practices. Again, as you hover over these various conservation practices, a summary will appear at the bottom to describe what they are. The next step for implementing a conservation practice is to enter the amount of land area or length to modify with that conservation practice, and you will apply that change. At this point, you've run the model, 
you've imp you implemented a change in the landscape and the model has updated its results, but it's a good idea now to rename the scenario that you've developed. In this case, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, I have three icons that have appeared representing the three conservation practices that I changed in this scenario. But renaming your scenario will help you keep track of what you've done. And now we want to compare the changes in water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment flux to the current conditions. And we do that using the compare button. And the first thing we'll see is graphs that show hydrology changes and various metrics of hydrology between our current condition and the changes that you've made to your watershed. Note that you can switch between a graph view and a table view using the buttons in the upper right-hand corner. At this point, you can continue to add changes to the scenario you've just built. You can add a new scenario, or you can add changes to climate data and settings. I won't talk about changing climate data and weather or settings in this, but please refer to the help material for understanding how to go about making those changes in your modeled area. At this point, you've done a lot of work. You've created a new project with a different model. So it's a good idea to rename this project uh, for future reference and share it. You do that by clicking the share button in the upper right hand corner, enabling link sharing, and then you can copy and paste a link to your model and its results in documents and email. Finally, know that if you've created an account in Model My Watershed, that all of your projects are saved for future reference. You can go back and revisit those projects, continue to change them, and share them by creating an account at modelmywatershed.org. That's all I have, Dave. Excellent, Scott. Very nice. Um, I will go ahead and share screen for Steve's presentation. Let's hold off on questions for Scott until the end. And as I fumble around here. Right. OK, Steve, go for it. OK, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say, wow, Scott, that was an incredible presentation. I'm glad this is being videotapes because I want to go back and go through it again. I, I thought I was familiar with Model My Watershed, but there is a heck of a lot more to it that I've yet to play around with and investigate. So anyway, what my presentation is, is uh, actually, I guess you can call it a case study where I've actually used a tool for some information and gathering. Uh, but first of all, I would be remiss if I did not start off my presentation by thanking Stroud Water Research Center for their work and providing easy to use and readily accessible tools for citizen scientists to use. So jumping into my, my story here, uh, the following story is true. No real names have been changed to protect the innocent. However, this story is a testament to the value of Stroud Center's Model My Watershed tool and provides an example of how it may be applied. Dave, could you go to the next slide, please? And could you please run the video? So on July 9th of last year, I was sitting in a restaurant in Reading, waiting for the torrential downpour to stop. And as you can see through the windshield of my car, we have a big storm flow going on here. So when we left the restaurant, my first attempt to go home was to take Route 183. It turned out that the road was closed. Uh, then we went down another road called License Bridge Road and found what we had just seen here in this video. Dave, you want to replay that video again, please? So what we're seeing here is that th there was so much water flowing across the road that was actually waves forming. You can kind of see them in the background there. It was actually waves forming. That's how intense the flow was. So if we go to the 
Next slide, Dave, please. So what we have here is basically what was going on on that day. This is some information on the rainfall. And uh, from two differences on the left there is basically gives you an idea of the hourly amount of rainfall. You can see it was pretty intense there for quite a few hours. And then to the right there is some rainfall data over a 24 hour period. It's from an, from an organization called Coco Ross, uh, which is basically volunteers that record data into a central database. And if you take a quick scan of those numbers, hopefully you can see them on your screen. There's quite a, a variation uh, over a relatively short uh, span of how much rain fell that day. Uh, what was going on in regards to the amount of rainfall, the, the United States uh, Geological Survey defines things like an ephemeral stream as a stream or reach of stream that flows it's only in direct response to precipitation, typically with flow occurring only for a short duration during the precipitation. So what we had seen in that video, typically, obviously, it was going across a road. There's no water flow there on any given day. Only when we have a heavy rain, a very heavy rain, do we actually get water across there. So Dave, next screen, please. So what I'm showing there, if you can see, there's a, I don't know if you can zoom in on it or not. They have a little yellow icon. It's in sort of the bottom center there, or just highlight it. Yeah, that's where I was sitting in our car looking uh, to the south, which is the bottom of the screen. And the water was flowing uh, right next to that large building there down its driveway, essentially. And where it was originating from, if you can zoom back out, Dave, please. It was originally from that farm field, which is basically the, the time that satellite picture was taken, it was nothing planted in that field, but the water was basically coming from that location. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. And you can see there, it's almost in the center of the view, there's that uh, barren section there of lying fallow, and you can maybe see the little yellow icon again where I was parked, but the nearest body of water, at least what's shown and the USGS maps is, is the Schuylkill River, which is basically off to the right of where I was sitting. And then there's another body of water a little bit off to the left there. That's the Plum Creek. And again, that's probably three quarters of a mile away from where I was sitting. So there's no water shown in that immediate vicinity. Uh, that, by the way, this information comes from the EPA's uh, watershed assessment, and that's based on a national hydrology data set, which has a uh, uh, you know, great information there, but obviously it's kind of limited in how detailed it gets. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Dave. So basically what we're seeing here is a view from Model My Watershed, which gives a little bit more detail. There's a, there's a stream coming off of the Schuylkill River there. You can off to the right where the Schuylkill River makes a couple bends you can see that there's an extra stream that was not shown on the previous Google Earth slide because it didn't give that level of detail. Uh, one more down, Dave, please. And then as we go diving deeper, and this was mentioned in Scott's presentation about the different levels of uh, detail that you can get. And if you look there on, on the lower center of my screen, I went in and looked at a, a more detailed view and you can see there's a lot more streams that now appear on the map as compared to what we were looking at in the Google Earth view. Next one down, Dave. And so what I did using a, a feature that, that was mentioned in Scott's presentation, I went in uh, and I uh, selected an area or a point within that area where I saw that water flowing during that during that uh, rain event. And I formed, a, basically identified what the watershed area was. And if you look to the left there, you can see the information about what was going on. And if I can zoom in a bit, if you drill down further, you see that the accompanying stream table shows no flow for even the lowest order stream, which just makes you think back to that same one day, if too far, <laughs> come on back up. <laughs> uh, Another one and one more, there we go. You can see that um, there's no flow shown in that table to the left. And that is because these streams, although they're identified as potential places where water is flowing during a normal course of things, there is no water there. In fact, 
that particular area, because it's a farm field, there was no even obvious channel where water may have flown in the past. It was probably just plowed over during the farming operations. Uh, next one, Dave. So as the plot thickens, <laughs> it just so happens that there's a development that's in process right now. Actually, there's still uh, in the planning stage, nothing is, no earth has been moved at this point in time, but there is actually a, a sketch was submitted to the local planning commission showing that uh, plants are putting in an industrial development. And it just so happens to be very close to where, where we noticed that water flow was going on when I was sitting in my car that day. Uh, Dave, could you go to the next one, please? And then if you look uh, on the lower left-hand corner, this is basically uh, the, the site view we had seen on the previous slide. This is uh, zoomed in to the lower left-hand corner. And it just so happens that that's where the detention or retention, I'm not sure what it's going to be at, pond is going to be located for this site. And if you look closely, you can kind of see the contour lines and they're all sloping towards that detention pond, which makes a lot of sense, which is probably the reason why that water was collecting and flowing the way it did. Uh, next slide, Dave. So if, if I superimpose that site location on top of the map from model my waterways, you can see that uh, it just so happens that the uh, the one boundary, the site, the site sits right where that ephemeral stream is located. So, you know, kind of not not a good thing, maybe. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you guys can read that or not. On my screen is pretty tiny, but this is uh, from the Burn Township Stormwater Ordinance, and they do require that. Uh, so let me zoom in myself here so I can see what it actually says. So it follows uh, state DEP recommendations along with uh, best management practices. And it, and it does, the stormwater ordinance for the township does actually address intermittent streams as well as perennial. And it, it provides the requirements for, for setback locations. But the one thing that's a little bit uh, confusing or not obvious is, is uh, what what actually is an intermittent stream versus the eph ephemeral stream. Now, what's in the ordinance specifically says, if a perennial or intermittent stream passes through the site, the applicant shall create stream buffer extending a minimum of 50 feet to either side of the top of bank, et cetera, et cetera. If we look at the definitions from the Clean Water Act, intermittent or seasonal streams are defined as they flow during certain times of the year when uh, smaller upstream waters are flowing and a, when groundwater provides enough water for stream flow, runoff from rainfall or other precipitation supplements the flow of the seasonal stream. During dry periods, seasonal stream may not have flowing surface water. Larger seasonal streams are more common in dry areas. And then as far as the definition of a ephemeral stream, it's uh, defined as a rain-dependent stream, flows only after precipitation. Runoff from rain rainfall is the primary source of water for these streams. So obviously what I was seeing from my car that day was e e ephemeral stream because typically there is no water flowing there unless we have a, a heavy rainfall. Uh, next slide, Dave, please. So, that's pretty much the end of my first case study. Uh, just to give you an update, that development is still in the process of, of preliminary. They don't have, what we were looking at there was basically a submittal for uh, what, was, uh, what was subdivision. They're planning to subdivide that property. So they provided some information as what they were thinking of doing in the long run, but there was not a lot of detail in terms of how they're gonna be handling the potential for all this extra water. Uh, the way it was left, I did provide this information to the township supervisors and they in turn provided it to the developer and, and, and he in turn has gone out and he's done some, some borings to determine how high the, the, the aquifer is in that area and, and try to figure out how they're gonna deal with, with the additional uh, stormwater, which is gonna be coming through that area because obviously they're gonna be putting 
and a lot more impervious surfaces than are out, out there right now since it's a, only a farm field. Now, this the existing soil out there is sort of clay, so it doesn't percolate real, real well to begin with. But obviously, they, they will need to design their detention retention basin to absorb all the potential additional stormwater flow that could be coming from the development of that site. So basically, in, in, in that regard uh, to the flooding situation, the re requirement is that the post-development discharge rates shall not exceed pre-development rates for design storms. So they're really not on the hook to try to mitigate what's already happening when we get heavy rains. But it, it looks like that they may be doing that just because of the location of the stormwater basin will take some of that flow that only has been accumulating and going down and crossing the road. So just hope for the best on that. But they they are on the hook to make sure that any additional impervious, impervious surface that they introduce is going to be accommodated by holding the water back in the detention retention pond. So another uh, quick presentation I wanted to go through just to show how we're using this, uh, the models in, in the model my watershed. So during the summer of uh, 2023, the Tulpahawken Creek Watershed Association focused our attention on learning about a key component of our watershed, which is the Blue Marsh Lake. So we researched available data utilizing utilizing the Stroud's uh, Model My Watershed. And we also consulted with the rangers at Blue Marsh and we attained some keyhole marker language KML electronic files of Blue Marsh Lake, their lands and their waterways. And then we combined these res resources into uh, Google Earth as well as Excel spreadsheets to get a better feel for, well, we identified essentially 13 streams. You see those little yellow pin markers on the, on the view on the screen there. That's the locations where we did some uh, some water testing to determine what kind of nutrients are coming into the lake from all those different locations. Uh, next next slide, Dave, please. So what we found of, of very valuable was looking through moder model my watershed. And uh, we found a lot of data, not only on the whole Topahawk and Creek watershed itself, which is what's being displayed on the screen here. And, and similar to what Scott had hit on in his presentation, there's, there's a, quite a, a mass of information in there that, that can be gleaned out in regards to trying to identify what's going on within the watershed and, and things that are impacting it. Uh, next slide, Dave. So, so the next thing we did, we actually went in and focused on all the individual uh, streams, those 13 streams that feed into the Blue Marsh Lake. And we were able to, to glean information about those specific uh, watersheds based on what was in the model of my watershed. Uh, the one thing that we looked at, and, and Scott touched on this as well, was the multi-year model, which uh, simulates the 30 years of daily water nutrient sediment fluxes, uh, which were established with the software. And one of the reasons we're doing this is we're trying to get a, a feel for the significance of, of all these waterways compared to each other. Uh, Blue Marsh Lake has been starting to have problems with the harmful algal bloom, which, which obviously is, is related to the amount of nutrients coming into the lake. So we're trying to identify what were the worst contributors and, and maybe come up with some ideas on how we might uh, mitigate some of those problems. Uh, next slide, Dave. So we, we basically put together a, uh, a table comparing the, the nitrates and the phosphates as well as the nitrogen and the phosphorus that were coming in, into the lake through those various streams to help us focus on which ones we wanted to pay more attention to. But one thing, and again, Scott mentioned this a number of times, and it's very important. I was a little bit remiss in not doing enough background searching myself is you really should use that the help uh, menus that are available in the in the model my watershed because there's a, there's a lot of information in there and and you really need to have a thorough understanding uh, initially i was mistakenly trying to compare what i thought was apples to apples when i was looking at total nitrogen versus the nitrates and and obviously there's a significant difference between the two but again we were trying to get a handle on the relative significance 
of one stream to the other. And just quickly looking at the data here, you can see that the Topahawken Creek, which is located, what is that, the fourth or fifth one down here, was, is uh, significant in the amount of nitrogen concentration that's been there over time, as well as what's going in in terms of the, the one test that we did, and, and also similar for the, for the phosphate and phosphorus, the numbers are high in that, that stream there. And next slide, please. And again, for people like myself, who don't have much of a chemical background. Uh, the relationship between the total phosphorus and the phosphate, including the orthophosphate, which is basically what our test kits are measuring, th they can vary depending on the composition of the sample being analyzed. The concentration of phosphate in a TP measurement or total phosphorus measurement is just one component of the total phosphorus. And a proportion of phosphate to the total phosphorus will depend on the specific sources of phosphorus in the sample. And similarly for total nitrogen, TN, that's the sum of all the nitrogen forms. It includes the ammonia nitrogen, organic nitrogen, uh, nitrite, nitrate. And the, our test method, again, using a Lamott uh, test kit, is only measuring the nitrates as NO3-N. And in and, and a stream with the active nitrification process, nitrates may indeed constitute a substantial proportion of the TN, but the specific percentage can vary widely and is influenced by many factors. Uh, uh, next slide, please, Dave. So again, this was a, a table that we put together comparing the, the different streams that feed into Blue Marsh. And also thanks to the information in Mile My Watershed, we, we have a rough idea of what the actual flows coming through each of those sources are on an on a annual basis in pounds per year, but we converted it to gallons per day to make it more understandable. And it's when you start looking at these numbers, it's kind of mind boggling. You know, Blue Marsh Lake has about 16 billion gallons of water in it. So it's 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 not a it's not a small water body for sure. But just from the Topahawken Creek alone, there's there's 95 million gallons per day that are flowing into that lake. So and when you think about the concentration of the, of the nutrients in that water, it's a, just a ton of nutrients coming into that lake all the time. So in summary, as uh, noted in some of our previous Topalton Creek Watershed, Watershed Association reports, discrete chemical testing only provides an extremely limited view of the nutrient concentration and the properties of a stream. Projections based on limited sampling will have questionable accuracy. As TCWA learned from our previous testing results over a three-year period, albeit, albeit only one test per year, results vary significantly in many of the streams for most locations tested. Now, monthly monitoring, which Topahawken Creek does on one of the streams in our area, it provides a little better indication of stream water quality and may eventually uh, lead to display of seasonal variability and also lead to possibly identifying causes of quality change. So field testing, although limited in scope, provides a useful screening tool. Potential problem areas in future monitoring sites can be identified using these re results. However, continuous monitoring is the only way of getting an accurate picture of stream properties, such as the quantity of nitrates and phosphates being carried by a stream. Hoping the mayfly centers will someday <laughs> incorporate nutrient monitoring. So as can be seen from these presentations, Model My Watershed has proven to be a valuable tool, both in identifying unseen water courses, as well as understanding relative differences between waterways within a common watershed. So thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Scott. Um, we have a few minutes if folks have questions. Any questions for our presenters? And actually, why don't I... Uh, Some of these guys ought to be here. <laughs> what's that, Bill? <laughs> All right, let me go back to... 
and I share a screen and we will finish off here. Um, mentors, if anyone needs direct assistance regarding stations or anything else, feel free to reach out to me or these mentors. Um, our next meeting is Thursday, March 21st. And again, contacts. Um, I, so hey, Dave, you had a couple I, of questions in yeah, the I, chat. Okay, great. I'm going to stop recording at this point, and then we'll take questions.